Welcome, I'm Don Ennis. In this episode of Rise Up, we're going to talk about something that is essential to everyday life. We've been talking about activism, about standing up and getting off your butt. This time I want to talk about something that goes to your heart and your mind. I'm talking about faith. Now hang on, I'm not talking about religion. You can be atheist or agnostic and you can believe in just humans, your fellow human being. But no doubt you know how I feel, that sometimes your faith is shattered. Shattered by our elected leaders, by our family and friends, by strangers. The faith I'm talking about right now is the kind of faith that I think is more important than just activism. It's the kind that will truly affect change, to make a difference. It's not just enough to volunteer, it's not enough to march or sign a petition. You need faith. And where do you find that faith? I find mine in my children. Where do you find yours? Uh, my kids give me faith. They, um, they're activists in the community. They are um, good people. They give me faith in the world that it's going to be a good, become even a better place. Faith is your belief. Faith is something that you believe in and that you want to work towards, you know, whether it can be like if you have faith in a higher being such as God, you know what I'm saying? If you have that faith and you believe in Him, it sort of pushes you in a way, like it encourages you basically. I'm asking people what gives you faith? What does faith mean to you? I had to completely change my mind from yeah. shopping from Yeah, exactly. Just for spur of the moment, what comes, up, what comes to it's mind a first? Tangible um, feeling, maybe sense of community that if people, a po and it's certainly a positive thing along that line. That's as far as I'll go. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's awesome. That's very deep. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. So, what about you? Did you say a friend? An elder? A leader? Perhaps an author? Well, we're very fortunate to have someone who combines all of those amazing skills. Stephen Fuchs is Rabbi Emeritus and served as Senior Rabbi of Congregation Beth Israel in West Hartford from 1997 until 2011. Following his retirement, he began an appointment as President of the World Union for Progressive Judaism. He traveled the world while serving in that role until October 2012 he has gone on to give lectures all around the planet. He is the author of three books, What's In It For Me, Finding Ourselves in Biblical Narratives, Torah Highlights, and Why the Kof, Getting the Best of Rabbi Fuchs, a collection of his essays and blog posts. Welcome, Rabbi. I'm Thank so glad you, you can be here today. Pleasure. So we met 13 years ago when <clears> I <throat> and my family decided to join Congregation Beth Israel. Before we talk about how a nice Jewish boy from New Jersey made such an impression on the world, I'd like to ask you something that I've been wanting to ask you for 13 years. How is it that you've kept your faith amidst, amidst all the challenges of both the world and your personal life? I believe that there is a plan for my life. I believe that in ways far beyond my ability to explain, God has my back. And I think that that's possible for everybody, but I've felt it and I've been blessed to feel it. Not everybody can, not everybody does, but I have. And I have come to believe that when a door closes, another will open. It's our job to keep moving forward, to keep walking. And it's also our job not to make excuses. I was blessed with an ice hockey coach in high school who said, if you lose the game, nobody cares if you had a headache or you had to study for a test tomorrow or your ankle hurt. They only care about who won and what was the score. And I've tried to keep that in mind. Not everything has gone perfectly for me, and I just try to move forward as best I can, learn from the experience, and hopefully do better next time. There is a painting when you walk into Congregation Beth Israel, the side entrance. It's a picture of Jacob. And you told me once the story of that picture. I was wondering if you'd share it with our viewers because to me, its significance is very relative to today. I think it is. It's a depiction of Jacob wrestling with the angel in Genesis 32, where he has come to struggle with all that he has done and all that he has been. The one who cheated his brother out of his birthright stood 
and lied through his teeth before his blind father to steal his brother's blessing. And now, after he has been put through the mill for 20 years by his uncle Laban, he is ready to face the future as a new person. And the night before he is to meet Esau, his brother, who he has good reason to fear, wants to kill him. He comes to grips and wrestles with all that he has done and all that he has been, and that's what that story is about. He's holding fast to an angel, to some manifestation of God, to the image of his brother, to his conscience. Take your pick. And they struggle all night long. And as dawn breaks, the angel says, let me go. Dawn is breaking. I got to get out of here. And Jacob says, uh-uh, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And so I think that for all of us, if we see the situations that we face in life, however tough, however stiff the rejection that sometimes hits that smack in the face, I think if we can find a way to say, I'm not letting go of this situation until I extract a blessing from it that enables me to move forward, I think that's a great model for life. How is it that you decided to become a rabbi? And can you tell us a little bit about, was there any conflict in that decision? Well, I could talk about how I decided to become a rabbi for the next hour, but <laughs> when I entered college, I thought I'd be a lawyer. When I was 19, I was in an auto accident, and I was told that we would meet our lawyer, who I thought was there to tell the world and prove to everybody, like Perry Mason, that I was innocent of this and the person suing me and everybody else in the accident, it was a big pile up on a highway, uh, had no grounds to sue me. Now, now I know, when, that I didn't know when I was 19, that that lawyer was there to get out of there as quick as he could with as little damage to the ex-check care of the insurance company as possible. But I thought he was there to make it possible for a neon sign to go on the courthouse, Stephen Fuchs did not cause this accident, just like Perry Mason did. And, so I get to the courthouse, and there's this melange of people, uh, just thousands, it seemed like, and lawyers holding up, shouting, where is the office? Where is Della Street? Where is the uh, attorney who's here to defend my honor? And I guess to make this story just a little bit shorter, it sort of soured me on the law mm -hmm. as an outlet for my idealism. Now, that may or may not have been valid, but I began to look for another avenue, and here it is. Was it something about you, how you interact with people that drew you to the revenant? I've always liked to hear people's stories. I've always been interested in who they are, where they come from, why they think the way they do, and why they do the things they do. And so I would say, sure, that's a natural quality for a rabbi or anybody in a helping profession to have. You know, when I came out in 2013, I was hunted and taunted by the paparazzi and the tabloids. And the first person to come to my defense was this man sitting next to me. He was very upset, actually. I'm probably the first transgender person you've ever met. And I'm wondering, why did you take up the cause as you did? Well, first of all, yes, you are the first transgender person I've ever met in person, but I was familiar with the story of Renee Richards. Now, here was a successful ophthalmologist, good enough to be on the world tennis circuit, and yet compelled to be somebody else. That had to be a strong compulsion. The price that you paid was horrific. It didn't seem fair. It didn't seem fitting. I believe that God creates us all with a destiny, but it's our job to seek that destiny, and we gotta follow it wherever it goes. And it struck me that you were doing that. And as one who believes my personal covenant with God causes me, as God charged Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, to be an example for the world and to teach his children and everybody else he could get a hold of about tzedakah umishpat, righteousness and justice, that this was a case where you were being treated with the opposite of those things and that it wasn't fair. And I think that while life is often unfair, our job as creatures, creatures, excuse me, created in God's image, is to do our best with what little abilities or talents we may have to make it a bit more fair. And it just seemed natural that you weren't being treated fairly and that I had the ability to speak up and I did. 
Our show is about activism, and um, besides transgender issues, um, we talk about how you can do something other than just you know sit around and complain about how the world is. What do you do, and how is your um, work focused on activism and, and making a difference? Well, I think that each of us has to examine and determine what can we do to make a difference. I've said in many speeches, God didn't give me the ability to cure cancer, nor to make peace between Israel and the Palestinians, oh, although I would <laughs> sorely love to be able to do both of those things. If only. But if I'm able to speak out for causes and be an activist for things that I believe in, like universal health care, like encouraging our people to contribute generously to food drives because there are people who are not nearly as fortunate as we are and who are hungry, to help the homeless and to take up the cause of those who are disadvantaged in society. Our Torah refers constantly to ger yatom the almana, the stranger, the widow, the orphan, and the widow. And they represent those categories of people. You would fall under stranger because what you did made you to many a stranger. And that was a courageous choice and one that you had to follow. And if I or others can somehow in infinitesimal ways aid you to get there where you're going to be going a little easier, that's a privilege. And I believe that that gives God pleasure. And I will tell you that um, while an impression is made that a transgender person changes, the strangers actually are the people who you thought were going to be supportive and weren't. The person I was is still the person I am. I'm just in a better package. I, I am able to better express what I felt inside that I couldn't before. There's a show called Transparent. And when the father comes out to his daughter, I guess I should say her daughter, the daughter says, Daddy, are you going to be dressing up like a lady all the time? And the actor, playing the transgender woman, says, My whole life I've been dressing up like a man. This is me. There's a Jewish, um, I guess it's Hebrew expression, tikkun olam. Very good. Can you explain what that is? It means to repair the world. It means that our goal, I believe, Fundamentally, and I think as a Jew, everything we do, the bar mitzvah that you're... My oldest and my daughter, and then uh, 2019, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, confirmation, uh, so if Jewish year, weddings, yeah. funerals, the holy days, festivals, the lot. Yeah. All are designed in different ways to inspire us to use whatever abilities we have to make the world a little bit better. And... That is what tikkun olam is. And as I say, we're not all Martin Luther King, and we're not all Michael DeBakey, and we're not all Barack Obama. We're not all Stephen Fuchs, but look at this here. You've written three books, and two of them are in foreign languages. Would you tell us a little bit about the writing you've done? Gladly. My first book really percolated for 40 years. It grew from an assignment I got when I was a young rabbi in a very small congregation, the first rabbi they had ever had. Where? In Columbia, Maryland, okay. which had very little money to pay my salary. The Baltimore Board of Rabbis took pity on me and offered me the munificent sum, which was significant, of $600 to teach a 10-session introduction to Judaism class sponsored by the conservative and reform rabbis of the entire area. And to teach that course, it was very easy to find popular books on Jewish history, Jewish Holy Days and Festivals, Modern Jewish Thought, but very little, if anything, from a non-Orthodox perspective, a non-fundamentalist perspective, on Torah, on the foundation of our faith, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible and the stories that are in them. And so over these 40 years, I've worked on this, and I wanted a short book because, you know, they have now wonderful non-Orthodox Torah commentaries, but they're huge. Mm. This you can put in your briefcase when you take the train to Manhattan. <laughs> and I wanted a popular book that people could read and understand, but one that had integrity. And I'm very pleased with the reception it's got. And yes, I am very pleased that it has been German, translated into German and into Russian. And God willing, a Spanish edition is in the works oh, at this point. Because the Spanish edition, you know, in America will be much more 
popular, I think, than either the German or the Russian. So, I agree. you know, I've done a lot of work in Europe, as you know, yeah. and that's why these came about. This came about because the German pastor, and this is a wonderful example of interfaith understanding, Pastor Ursula Sieg and her husband, Pastor Martin Pomerenning, who host Vicky and me for the past three years for 10 weeks in their home while we go all about the country speaking about different things. I speak in churches, I teach in synagogues, I conduct worship for the High Holy Days, and Vicky and I teach in schools about the Holocaust. She would read my blog and she would say, okay, I don't care what you think about American football or popular music or <laughs> this, that, or the other thing that you write about. You right. should be writing about Torah. What I want you to do is write a short comment each week on the Torah portion read in synagogues around the world. I will translate them into German and then we'll put them on your blog wow. quote for your German readers. Great. And then the idea percolated that we make it into a book. And this is a hardcover book. It is augmented with beautiful photos, cover and cover, and in between, from Congregation Beth Israel, the beautiful roundels that show the holy days and festivals of the Jewish year. And so I've often said, I hope people buy, read, and learn from this book. I hope that people buy, read, learn from, and treasure this book as an object of beauty in their home, and something which I hope finds a place on a Shabbat table, and before people light the candles on Friday night, there's a 300-word commentary on the portion that can provide a very nice short discussion oh. before Sabbath begins. And then you've got a third book. And that is the one my daughter, who is my severest critic, <laughs> calls my best book. Aren't they always? Um, why the Kuf? Kuf is a letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which is the first letter of the word Kadosh, which means holy. Okay. And I believe holiness is not some ethereal state of being or some kind of mystical experience. Holiness is being different from the norms of society. In other words, a culture that stresses greed, self-interest, is to be set aside for one that pursues the values of care and kindness and compassion and taking up the cause of those who are being attacked by others. And so it also was in a book, which I read as a child, a, the Jewish alphabet book with short little children's <laughs> stories about each Hebrew letter. Alphabet, right? Uh, the Alphabet storybook. <laughs> and Kuf, the story about the Kuf was my favorite story. And so it became the, became the first essay in this book and the title for this book. And there is a Why the Kuf Volume 2 in <gasps> contemplation. So oh. I'm very excited about that. Susan Marie Schumann is the editor and she has done a wonderful job of putting this together and culling the essays. And I'm very, very proud of it. And, and you told me you can get all these on Amazon except for... Torah Highlights is only available either, you can get it through my website for me. What's the name of the address? Uh, uh, RabbiFuchs.com, www.RabbiFuchs.com, and you can find it on Amazon DE, that's Amazon Deutschland. And we'll link that on LifeAfterDawn.com. But Bye -bye these, are other on, uh, these two are on Amazon.com. I'll make sure that all the links are up so all our viewers can at least sample them. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure having you here. Thank, Thank you, you again for honoring us. Now, as if we do every month, we have a special correspondent. And this month, it's Jillian Cameron. She's a scholar, an artist, and she's also a parent. And she's in Southern California to tell us why she's rising up. Hi, Don. Thank you so much for including me. So, I have been busy as all get out. And part of that is the fact, this is the cat. Part of that is the fact that after 36 years of teaching high school English and filmmaking, I retired in June. And you would think that being retired meant that you're going to sit around reading French novels and eating bonbons. Nothing could be further for the tr from the truth. I have never been so busy in my life. And this is also the first time in my life where I have been Jill pretty much 24-7. Uh, there are still a couple of family issues that need to be, maybe never will be, ironed out. I've never been happier. I, my first baby is this right here. This is Kalogwanant, and it's a webcomic, 
and it's the story of a knight in Arthur's court who's 17 years old, has just been made a knight, and is transformed into a maiden. This is the story, Cologne is a story that's based on a 13th century French romance, just a piece of it, about a knight in Arthur's court who was transformed into a maiden and then has to find the three best knights in all the world. And I said, eh, I'm just going to make sure that this is somebody who wanted this transition. And so I started drawing the web comic about four and a half years ago. I've published two books so far. And uh, the second one, I'm going to move the cat. The first one is Cologrenant Book the First, Oh What a Night. The second is Cologrenant Book the Second, Maiden Britannia. And this one has a foreword by a very um, astute and very respected journalist on the East Coast whose name is Don Ennis. And I am so proud and so happy to have that forward. Cologrenant is posted online every Sunday night at 10 o'clock Pacific Time so that it shows up in the morning for folks uh, in Europe and then on the East Coast. And it's been a labor of love and it's something that I have been doing um, not just because I love the Arthurian legend, but also because this is a way of dealing with trans issues in a way that's not <sighs> preachy. Callie has to learn what it is to be a woman, uh, has to learn about the limitations that are set upon women and how to overcome that, and also how to learn to be herself and to find her abilities and rediscover her abilities and how she becomes even more uh, powerful, rising beyond, rising up and rising beyond. Um, I'm very proud of it and I think it will have a lifetime. I, I think it's going to probably last me the rest of my life to tell the story. That's only one of the things I've been doing. Twice I have been an extra on uh, Transparent and I have never seen, I've seen a couple of film crews in my day, but I have never seen a more wonderful, uh, together, loving group of people than the producers, cast, and crew of Transparent. And even though I've had a small part of it, I am very, very proud to have been part of it, and I hope that I can be part of it once again. I've also been part of a short film directed and written by Allison Tate Cortese, a um, marvelous, very, very talented young woman. And this is called The Carol Support Group. And it's a short satirical film about people who are addicted to the film Carol. And that is expected to air soon on the HERE network. And I've also been told that it's been entered into at least one uh, film festival. I've got a couple of stage performances coming up. My friend Alexa Hunter and I are going to be in a two-woman show that will be on the 19th and 20th of this month at Highways Performance Space uh, in Santa Monica. And that is called the Alexian, the Alexian, Jillian and Alexa, so we put the words Alexian Chronicles, an alchemical cabaret. And it's about getting older, it's about changing your job, changing your life. The metamorphoses that we go through just in getting older, but also as we gain knowledge and re reinvent, reconstruct ourselves. And that's not just age and in terms of your your career, but also in my case, in terms of coming to uh, an understanding of myself as a woman. I'm 65 years old, but I'm just beginning. I think the important thing is having the nerve to do 
what you have always wanted to do. There's a, a Greek concept, uh, the daimon. It looks like demon, but it's daimon. This is kind of like your guardian angel. And your daimon chooses where you were born, to whom you were born, under what conditions, and also chooses what your purpose is. It's a little bit like dharma for Hindus. And if you can follow your daimon, if you can find that thing that is what you love more than anything else and do that. I used to tell my students that if you can do what you love and get paid for it, that is success. It's not about being rich. It's not about uh, getting things. I would be drawing, somebody today asked me if I make a whole lot of money doing Cologne. No, I don't. I don't make a whole lot of money. I've sold a few books. I hope sometime that somebody will pick it up as an animated feature. But what I really have found is a sense of fulfillment. I feel like I'm telling a good story. And I feel like I am uh, bringing something into other people's lives. And I'm expressing myself as an artist and a creator. And that is part of the process of rising up and becoming your own person and following the quest for yourself. And it's not just about being trans. It's about being anyone. It's about being authentic. So there we are. And I've never been happier. I've never been busier and I enjoy my life so much. Thank you again, Dawn, for asking me to be on the show, and back to you in the studio. Thanks, Jillian, and thank you for watching. To find out more about Jillian Cameron, to find out more about Rabbi Stephen Fuchs, and to get other resources, go to lifeafterdawn.com. That's our website, and we have all the information you need right there on your screen, lifeafterdawn.com. That's it for this time. We'll see you next month with another episode of Rise Up. And as Bruce Springsteen sang, come on, rise up.